morning, church. Morning, saints. Morning, sinners. I didn't hear a response. Uh, we also say good morning to those joining us on YouTube. I don't know if we're streaming live, but I do know the service is broadcast at a later time. So we welcome them in its uh to our service. Please uh, turn with me without further ado to James chapter 2. We're going to get right into the word this morning. I love, uh, Pastor Masala, what you said about woman. And uh, always reminded of that lovely Jewish narrative which comes out sometimes in weddings. You know, why did God not take the bone out of Adam's foot? Uh, that was because he didn't want him to rule over her. Uh, why didn't he take the bone from Adam's head? Didn't want her to rule over him. But took the bone out of the rib, close to the heart, that they might love each other, and under the arm that he might protect her. Isn't that special? I know the feminists would bridle and say, we don't need protection. Folks, South Africa today, women need protection. And men, we need to take our place and protect them with everything we've got. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. There's one verse you want to remember out of the whole passage. It's this. Verse 1, suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit at the floor, sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom He promised to those who love Him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming? the holy name, the noble name, to him whom you belong. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shan't commit adultery, also said, you shan't murder. If you don't commit adultery, but do commit murder, you've become a lawbreaker. Therefore, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who's not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Father, we do ask the unction of your word this morning to penetrate our hearts. Uh, sometimes we're so calloused, Lord, uh, desensitized uh, to this, this holy word. Breakthrough, we pray. Uh, by your spirit, Lord, speak to our hearts. Open our minds to receive what you have in store for us. Amen. So last week, our brother Rob touched on what James calls pure religion. Okay, I know that word has got a little bit of bad press, but just so much in that last bit of chapter 1 that we haven't got right about pure religion, uh, faultless religion, what really God is looking for in the worship of His name. The part I found striking was the link that James makes with our speech, what we say and how we say it with the way we worship, with what we bring before the Lord. Did you pick that up in verse 26? Just take a look, chapter 1. Those who consider themselves religious and yet don't keep a tight rein on their tongues, their religion 
is worthless. They deceive themselves. So there's a strong link between what we say and how we worship. If we're not controlling our speech properly, our religion is without value. And I think this is coming off the back of James's main point earlier on that we ought to be slow to speak. Amen? Slow to anger, but also slow to speak. I don't know if you agree with me, but I think a symptom of our times is verbal diarrhea. You heard that expression? If our obsession with social media is anything to go by, we are garrulous. The words just pour from our mouth and they have very little meaning, very little value to add to the world around us. Young people, how carefully do we measure our words? And it's lovely to see in the Old Testament when the prophet Samuel was going up, we read in the Bible that his words did not fall to the ground because the Lord was with him. And that's a lovely picture, a way that we can ask ourselves, what impact are our words having? Is what I say just hot air? Am I just babbling? Or does every word actually accomplish something? It doesn't fall to the ground. Our words are salty. Isn't that a lovely expression? They have effect. They, they change agents. And if Jesus said that it's what comes out of a person that defiles them, then James is putting it a little bluntly. Okay? Our spirituality is measured by our speech. So how does your spirituality measure up? Indeed, for James, right religion isn't so much about what we say, but about what we do. And if we're taking the context seriously, then yes, it's our attitude to the poor. And yes, it's our attitude to those who've been bereaved. And yes, it's our behavior to those who've been, who have lost their parents, orphans. Basically, those in distress, those on the margins... In James's time, those who had no voice, they had no power. No one spoke for them. So who was looking out for them? James says, doers of the word look out for such. Doers of the word don't see caring for such folks as an optional extra. For them, it is my religion. This is validating my faith. And then James chapter 2, what we're talking about this morning, doers of the word do not show favoritism. Okay? I don't know if you want to put the next slide there. I, it's such an important verse, this, that I want to give us the literal translation. Do not, in favoritism, hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the glory. That's how it translates. It's a bit wooden. But I think you get the picture. Do not in favoritism hold the faith in the Lord. And that word favoritism is the Greek prosopolemsia. Can you say that with me? Prosopolemsia. And it literally means to receive someone according to their face. Isn't that interesting? No wonder we put on makeup in the morning. We want people to like our face. Proso. In other words, judging based on external appearance. Pretty relevant word. The example that James uses in verse 2, I think is still relevant today, 2,000 years after these words were written. Basically, seating people, and presumably this is a church environment. Some people argue that it's a Christian court, but it looks like a church Seating them according to how they dress. Have you been to a church where you've seen that? You know, maybe it's a crowded uh, congregation. You get to the back door and um, the ushers look you up and down. <laughs> if you're wearing a suit, you have a seat, my friend. Right in the front. It's happened to me and it's happened to some of you as well. You just get free pass. If you're a little more shabbily dressed, well, just uh, see what you can get. And I think the custom of wanting to honor men of God is, is very strong on this continent. 
We like to show that kind of deference as a mark of our respect. But here James is stating the obvious, my friends. Someone who is wealthy stands out in a poor congregation by the way that they might dress. But to give that person preferential treatment while neglecting the more shabbily dressed person, well, James asks, have you not discriminated? Have you not classified? Have you not put people into boxes? Yes, we have. Not only that, we've also become judges with evil thoughts. Judges with evil thoughts. No offense to judges here present. But James chapter 4 verse 12 applies there is only one lawgiver and one judge. And you are not that person. You can't judge based on appearances. When we show favoritism, when we classify people based on appearance, we're actually usurping God's role as judge. Such thinking, says James, is evil. It doesn't mince these words. Such thinking, such behavior is wicked. I want you to take a look at verse 5 this morning. If you've got your Bibles, if, even if you've got your phones or your tablets, and you've got a highlight function on your device, I want you to underline one word here. I'm going to give it to you now. Listen, my bro beloved brothers and sisters, did God not choose? And I want you to underline that word, choose. Did not God choose the poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those loving him? Do you underline that word? God chooses the poor. And that's a pretty loaded word in the New Testament. We might say God has elected the poor to be rich in faith. And so show us the new community to which Jesus aspired when he plants the church. What does that new community look like? Does it look any different to other secular meetings happening across the country? And if you want a parallel in Paul's writings, you might check out 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Just a powerful passage. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are so that no one can boast before him. Amen. My friends, if we say amen to that passage, then we've got to understand what the gospel is all about. And in the grace of God, I believe that this is the power of the gospel, what Isaiah prophesies in chapter 43. Chapter 40, verse 3, that every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. There is a place for the poor among us. We see something of that. Coming out in Mary's song, the Magnificat, his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He's performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but sent the rich away empty. I know this is poetic language, and a lot of hyperbole comes into that poetry. But grace generation, the word of God is saying the, the poor have a place among us. In the world that James lived in, 
up to one-third of the population of the Roman Empire were slaves. And it's pretty likely that most of the church was poor. People with no voice, people with very few rights. And yet James says the Christian poor were rich in faith because they had no one to turn to but God. And I love the worship this morning. Thank you, worship leaders. You brought that out so strongly. We have no one else to turn to except Him. It's Him who validates us. It's Him who vindicates us. And it's these people, the Christian poor, who God has chosen to inherit the kingdom, verse 5. That's pretty powerful. Not just a future kingdom, but we understand it as a kingdom breaking into the present. Jesus inaugurated that kingdom, and it comes in places. It comes at times here and now. Don't we pray that in the Lord's Prayer? May your kingdom come uh, tomorrow, Lord. No. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does that look like? What does a congregation like that look like? I want you to note the qualifier. It's not all poor that stand to inherit the kingdom. James is pretty clear. The kingdom is promised to those who? Love him. But verse 6, we have dishonored the poor. Some translations use the word humiliated. Maybe James, as pastor of this first congregation in Jerusalem, has a specific example in mind that poorly dressed person coming to church and not finding a seat, and yet as soon as the suit arrived, that person is ushered into the front. I want us to think about that example for a moment. God has chosen the poor, and yet we have neglected them. We have overlooked them. Often in order to curry favor with the rich. And there's an African proverb, and maybe you can help me which country it comes from, but listen to this. Thin cows are not licked by their friends. Have you heard that before? It might come from West Africa. It may come from Madagascar. I haven't traced it. But I think it says a lot about society today. May that not be true of the church. May we look out for the thin cows. James asks in verse 6, Is it not the fat cows who oppress you? Is it not the fat cows who are dragging you to court? It's one thing to be poor. It's another thing being exploited because you're poor. And we're not sure why these folk were being hauled before the magistrate, but we do know in Bible times that the rich tried to grab land. They tried to get rich by extorting land from the poor. Remember the example of Naboth's vineyard? Another strategy was simply throwing your debtors in prison until they paid you. Obviously, it was a common occurrence because Jesus uses this as the basis of one of his most famous parables. Let's note again that James is not condemning wealth per se, but rather the unscrupulous actions of the wealthy, those that just had no regard for the poor. By those actions, James says, they blaspheme. And that is a strong word, my friends. By their actions, they blaspheme the good name by which you were called. So siding with exploiters, the church aligned itself with blasphemers. Whew. That's hectic. And you see how serious is this sad situation. But now James gives us in verse 8 the glorious alternative, keeping the royal law. And my friends, this is really uh, the heart of the gospel. Next slide, please. Verse 8, if, however, you fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. You do well. How James loves that word do. Amen? 
And this is where this pastor of the Jerusalem congregation supports his call to better behavior, supports his call to a higher ethic with good theology. What does it mean to keep the royal law? And really, this is the heart of the message this morning. It's a question we need to ask ourselves. What is the royal law? And it's such an important concept that I think we need to just unpack it a little bit and ask ourselves, what are the different interpretations? Well, firstly, the royal law, uh, can you give us that list there on the slide? The royal law could simply refer to the Old Testament law, uh, which is called the Torah. Okay, it's what Jews would read and hear expounded to them each and every day. That was the law. But secondly, the royal law could refer to the Torah as interpreted by Jesus, as expounded by Christ. And there's a big difference between those two concepts. Thirdly, the royal law could refer to a new law, something completely new that had nothing to do with the old. And then finally, the royal law could point to this love command, uh, so famously quoted from Leviticus, quoted as the fulfillment of God's will for his people. Uh, which of these are correct? Uh, which of them can we perhaps rule out? Well, I think we can rule out the first one, that James is talking here about the Torah, the Jewish law, the Old Testament Bible, because it's not possible in the terminology he uses when he describes it as the royal law. Uh, the word royal comes from the same root as the word kingdom. So this is kingdom law. The royal law is kingly law. The law we are to keep is so much more than just the Torah. What about the third option? That this is an entirely new law replacing the old. And I think we can dispense with this one because although he's a Christian, James is a Jew. And... Um, a Jew that respected the law that God had given in the Old Testament, he wouldn't have thrown out the baby with the bathwater. And in Acts chapter 15 at the Apostolic Council, we see how he brings the Old Testament law into his new instructions. The first Christians were all Jews who um, largely adhered to the Mosaic law. So this leaves us with option B and option D. Quickly, let's consider the last one, that the royal law is precisely this new commandment that's actually very old. Uh, it's rooted way back in the Pentateuch, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, where God instructs his people not to hold grudges, uh, not to seek revenge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Okay? And our late brother, uh, the teacher Michael Eaton, favored this option. He calls this scripture the law of the Christian, okay? The law of Christ, the law of faith, the law of the spirit of life. And for sure, this commandment to love one another is indeed the law of the Christian. It's the greatest law. Isn't that the question the scribe asked Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answered uh, that this one is part and parcel of the supreme commandment. But I would ask you, then, why doesn't James call it that? Why doesn't he say this is the greatest commandment or the supreme commandment or the highest commandment? Instead, he calls it the royal law. And I wonder if he's pointing here at the Old Testament law found in Scripture, but expounded by Christ, interpreted by Jesus in a radical way. Folks, a law that was written on our hearts, not just on stone or on paper, proclaimed by the king, and that's why it's royal, expounded by the one who has already inaugurated his kingdom. Well, we can spend a lot of time discussing those options and maybe I'll send it out as a bit of homework. But folks, one thing not up for debate is the fact that this is law. This is instruction that is meant to be obeyed. Okay? We are obliged to keep it. Loving our neighbor is not optional. 
no matter how poorly they are dressed, no matter what face they might present to you. And if we keep this law, if we really keep it, says James, you do well. It's interesting, if you look at the Apostolic Council, Acts chapter 15, he uses the same words at the end of his ruling. You do well. It's just another validation of the author of this letter. And the key word there is do for James. Faith isn't just about what you believe. It's how you live out what you believe. How you put your faith into practice. Well, positively, in terms of the royal law, we do well to obey it, but negatively, if we do not obey, we are convicted as lawbreakers when we show favoritism. And this is meant to hit us hard. Lawbreakers. Perhaps in South Africa, we don't really <laughs> feel too constrained by that. It was a big deal in James's day. It should be, in terms of God's law, a big deal for us. We if we show favoritism, we sin. Morally speaking, we miss the mark. And that means if we've missed the mark in one commandment, we have missed the mark in them all. That's how seriously James regards the sin of favoritism, of receiving people according to their external appearance. I just want to conclude this morning by saying, friends, if you are saved, there are two ways to live the Christian life. One is theoretically, and the other is practically. One way is to accept the royal law as theory, and for the rest of your journey on this planet, it remains just that, an intellectual truth that no one really lives by. You know, it's, yes, it's true, but no one really does it. Okay? It's like Peter Marisburg traffic lights. When they're working, the red actually means something. <laughs> and we know that. We accept that. That's the law. But how many of us actually observe it? How many of you observed it on your way to church this morning? <laughs> and that means I live under a different law. It's the law of me. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. No wonder James gets a little bit sweaty about showing favoritism. Does that describe your brand of Christianity? Because there's another way to live what we might call at Grace Generation the Shema lifestyle. Hearing and doing. Keeping the royal law. Not showing favoritism but favor to those who don't have a voice. It's a life where mercy triumphs over judgment. It's a life where compassion wins over condemnation. It's a life that recognizes and respects the image of God in everyone, in every human. And just by virtue of that alone, it's worthy of respect, worthy of protection. It's a life that does not blaspheme, but honors Christ as king of his inbreaking kingdom. Have you tasted this kingdom? Do you know what it, it means to be a subject under a king like Jesus? Is it just knowledge up here, or has it filtered down to your heart and to your hands? Folks, last Saturday I was listening to the lawyer Keith Mateer senior counsel and he said something that I'll never forget and I've actually written it down I am convinced that as a church in South Africa the revival we are seeking should be preceded by repentance I just want you to let that cook in your souls the revival we are seeking needs to be preceded by repentance we need to adopt my friends, an attitude of sorrow, of apology for the way that we've conducted ourselves as captains of our own fate, the way that we just push God out of our school's curriculums, 
out of the public sphere that this is just a private thing between you and God has nothing to do with our public lives. No. Why did Jesus say you are salt? Why did Jesus say you are light? You're meant to be change agents in your society. I know if Keith was here, he would talk about the, what he calls the daily sacrifice of 500 unborn babies. But I think there are so many other systemic sins that we can accommodate in that same category. Sins that we need to say sorry for. And if we are under the Lordship of Christ, then we must know that very poignantly this morning. What it means to be a Christian first. A citizen of the kingdom first before we are citizens of any other place, any other entity. Let's pray. Oh Lord, I, I want to say sorry this morning for being so proud. For showing favoritism, Lord. For treating people according to what they look like. But you, Father, look into their hearts and you see beauty. And you look into my heart and often you see something that shouldn't be there. And so we pray that our community, Lord, our community, our household of faith here at Grace Generation would be marked by parity. Would be marked by mutual respect. And Lord, that this respect for each other would be so so rejuvenating that others would see it and want to join in with this new com community that you have planted here in the midst of Peter Marisburg. Thank you for the word from Benson this morning to seek the prosperity of the city. And this, Lord, is one of the strategies by showing love, by caring for our neighbor, by showing favor to those who have no voice. Thank you for sharing this word with us. Um, I just want us to stand and, and pray before we go out. Um, if you can all stand, wherever you are, just stand there. Maybe like me, you are confused about showing favoritism, and we are saying I don't show favoritism to anyone. But do we care for the need? Let's consider it that way. Do you offer help to people who need help? Do you, as Pastor Musala was sharing with us this morning about women, how do you treat women? We men. Or even if you're a woman, how do you treat other women who are less fortunate than you are? My, my brothers and sisters, I think we all have to stand God, before God and say, Lord, help me. I want to do better. Lord, help me. I want to do better. I want to do better because as we do that, people will see the love of God in us and it will attract them to Jesus. And that's what we need to come before God. So just say something to God. Just in your own way. Whatever God is talking to you about, just tell God this morning. We thank you, our God, for your love for each one of us. And we say, Father, in many ways, we have not done we wanted, what you wanted us to do. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. But Lord, we thank you for your grace. 
that abounds for us. So be glorified and be praised forever that you are able to help us do better. And so our prayer is this morning as we live here, Lord, help us do better. Help us love and help those who need help. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.